Have you ever wished you could travel all over the world and meet masterful people in the field of education? People you may not have known and the stories you've never heard. Cup of Capacity is just that. I wanted to introduce you to masterful people in education. Some are people I have known and some I have heard about. They were chosen for their unique impact on education and to share the insights they've learned along the way. In a digital setting, each monthly episode features an in-depth conversation with a masterful leader as they explore their journey and answer a series of questions. Grab a refreshment and let's enjoy. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this month's Cup of Capacity. I'm super excited to be with you guys today. My name is Dr. Michelle Rosa, and as you may or may not know, I record an interview with someone who is a fascinating uh, literacy leader or instructional leader in the world of education each month. Uh, we usually focus on capacity and capacity building because it's connected to the original research I did in my doctoral work. And I'm super excited to introduce you to a friend and colleague of mine. I was thinking about how many years we've known each other. It's more years than I want to sit down and count. I just am going to say I've known her forever. Deb Diller, as you know, is an expert in all things literacy. She's an expert in lots of things, including literacy. She has been a teacher, she is a trainer, and she's the author of many, many books, including one that's coming out very soon about small group instruction, and we're super excited to uh, get our hands on that book. So um, without further ado, I want to introduce Deb Diller. Thanks, Michelle. Um, it's been a long time, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm delighted to be here with you um, to talk a little bit about capacity, and um, I've lived a long, full life. Um, with seems like I've been a teacher forever as well. Um, so I was kind of thinking about going back and tracing some of my roots um, of teaching, but not just teaching, but actually looking at being a writer. And I have kind of an interesting journey um, along the path of becoming a writer. I was just having this conversation with someone the other day, and I told them that when I was in school, we were not really taught how to write. Um, I don't remember other than handwriting and grammar and spelling. I don't remember a teacher modeling and showing me how to write, but my first published piece was in second grade. It's a story that I wrote at my grandmother's house called The Littlest Snowdrop. And it was about this early spring flower that came up and I wish I still had it today. I remember it was in the school newspaper. And um, that's one of my earliest thought remembrances of being and my earliest memories of being a writer. Um, before I came on today, I, I found one piece of writing that I did as a kid. Um, I have like the actual thing here. Somehow this did not get thrown away from the attic. Um, when I was in ninth grade, we had to write an autobiography and mine was called Yesterday. Like I had had such a long life before this. <laughs> so it was really interesting. Um, I wanted to share just a tiny bit of it. It had to have chapters and, you know, like, it's so funny. It's like, this is my first actual like book that I wrote. Oh, um, wow. And it, like, it's all like dog-eared, but I still got it. And so chapter one is called Look Out World. So I started my, um, my little autobiography saying, look out world, here I come. These would have probably been my first words if I had been able to speak at birth. And so I think I've always, I've always loved words. I've always loved reading and writing. And um, even back when I was 14 years old, I wrote in here that I hope to be an elementary teacher someday. Um, and if not an elementary teacher, then maybe um, I'd like to work in the field of fashion illustration because I like to draw. Um, and I would have been in touch with a field representative from the famous artist school. <laughs> Obviously, that ship has sailed. So I didn't do that. But if you've ever seen the drawings in my book, I actually do all of my all of my drawings. But I, I ended by saying, whatever I do, I hope to be of some help to people and an asset to this mixed up world. Awesome. So that is something that's been with me a long, long time. Um, so this whole journey of writing, like I say, it feels like I've always been a writer. But when I was in college, um, I of course I had to write papers. I didn't think anything that anything was special about them until I went to graduate school. And I had a professor talk to me about maybe publishing one of my papers. And he said, in fact, why don't you uh, maybe change your major from early childhood to psychology? 
He said, I really, you know, I think that that might be a good, a good avenue for you. And I said, no, I really like education. I especially like working with young children um, and working in that field. And um, he said, well, you know, you really could get this published. And I didn't know that I was really a good writer until I was in graduate school, just kind of weird. Um, And then I, um, I began writing professionally. A lot of people don't know this. I began writing professionally in 1983. It's the year that my son was born. And I, um, I was living in Dallas. I grew up in Pennsylvania, but I was living in Dallas. My husband was in the oil business. And um, I, I knew that Houghton Mifflin was located. They had, a, um, they had an office in Dallas. So I called them on the phone and said, hi, my name is Deb Diller and I, I am an educator and um, I would like to do some writing for you. So they invited me to come to the office and talk with me and they hired me to do some per diem work. Um, at the same time, I contacted a company in Pennsylvania called Continental Press, which was a workbook company. And I said, I'd like to do some freelance writing. And they said, well, you can write workbooks for us. <laughs> so back in 1983, I started writing workbooks. Wow. I also contacted a Sunday school company that created Sunday school curriculum. And they gave me a job writing Sunday school curriculum. <laughs> so I've written all kinds of crazy things over the years. At one time, I wrote tests for social studies. Um, at one time, I wrote bulletin boards. I, I drew bulletin boards. There's that art thing coming back. I drew bulletin boards um, for a spelling program from kindergarten through eighth grade. So I didn't start out writing books for teachers. I developed a lot of curriculum um, and um, Finally, in 1999, I was 19, yeah, it was 1998, 99. I was in a teacher research group in Houston, where I was living at the time. It was a group of amazing women from all over the city, and we met monthly at my friend Olga McLaren's house, and um, we would talk about issues in education and things we saw from all over the city, people from public school, private school, and so on. And I was really noticing, um, I was having a lot of problems. I was teaching first grade and I was having trouble with um, a lot of the little boys in my class that were getting in trouble and um, in particular. And I was noticing that outside of the office of the principal, there were always like these big long rows of little black boys that were sitting out there. And it really disturbed me. And so I went to my teacher research group and I said, you know, I'm really concerned. I said, I've been thinking about engage, engaging my kids and getting them more interested in learning. But now that I've seen all these kids lined up outside the principal's office, my thinking has changed. That's not what I want to learn about. And one of the girls in the group said, what, what do you want to study? And I said, I want to do teacher research on how to help young African-American boys as a white teacher. A lot of people don't know this part of my journey because it's not what I've written about. Trust me, I tried. (laughs) So as part of my being in this research group, I decided to write, um, write an article for the reading teacher that if I could get published in the reading teacher in 1999, that was going to be like my big dream of being a writer. And I wrote the article, it didn't get accepted right away, but they were interested if I'd make some changes. So I contacted um, one of the people that I, whose work I had read that really impacted me. There was a woman named Dr. Lisa Delpit, um, who was um, doing some really amazing work around uh, being an African American teacher, educator, um, working to reach um, reach kids. And I wrote her a letter and I said, I really want to have this published, but I uh, I would really like your opinion. And she wrote back to me. I. I have the letter it's on yellow on a yellow legal tablet she was at her daughter her daughter's dentist appointment when she wrote back to me and she said i celebrate the work you're doing here's some suggestions for you um you might also read these things and i got that article published oh wow so um it's still out there it's may 1999 it's called opening the dialogue and it's about working with young african-american children as a white teacher So I began speaking about this, hoping that maybe I could write some more about it. But the problem was that nobody really wanted to hear me talk about it. (laughs) Well, not nobody. That's not true. The people I was trying to reach were like the people like me that hadn't grown up with people of different cultures. Um, I grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania. Um, I often share the only minority in my um, in my town were Catholics. It's just where I grew up. I didn't, I didn't ask to be there. It's just how it was. And so, um, 
Anyway, so I tried to get published and writing about my work with African American kids and nobody wanted to publish it. So at the same time, I, um, I another part of this story kind of same time was I, um, I was teaching in a school system and um, it was the same place and I was trying to meet the needs of kids and really struggling, but it was getting better as I learned more about culture and how to make that work. And uh, one day I got called into the principal's office and I was told to stop teaching like I was teaching. And I was told that other, it was bothering other teachers um, that were on my team and that it'd be best if I just did with every, what everybody else did. Wow. And I didn't, I didn't take that very well. <laughs> In fact, I burst into tears and I said, I don't know how, I don't know how to do things any differently. This is, this is how I teach. And I am doing things differently than everybody else because my kids are different than the other classes. Um, at the time, I had three children reading on grade level, and everybody else was below level, and it was extremely difficult. And I didn't know then what I know about teaching reading today, because we didn't know a lot of what we know now. So anyway, what happened was I, um, I ended up staying at that school for the rest of the year, and one day an, another administrator who knew of my struggle came to me privately, and he said... If anybody knew I was here right now, I'd probably get in trouble. But if you're smart, you'll leave and you'll find another job. Wow. Because people here don't really like you. They don't really believe in what you believe and you'll never be able to reach your potential. So if you're smart, I think look for another job. So I did. And sometimes, um, you know, when you have these struggles, there are people that are just kind of like angels with skin on them. They come to your rescue and tell you the truth. And so I, um, I decided to, um, to change school systems. And I went to another school system that I'd worked in when I first moved to Texas um, many years prior. And I met um, my first principal was a wonderful woman named Betty Bennett, who later became Mrs. Betty Best, who now there is a school named after an A-Leaf. In a -leaf. And uh, I talked to Betty and she said, honey, come here. I'll get you. You know, we got we got jobs. <laughs> we'll certainly put you to work. So I went to work um, at, a, at a school. I went to her in elementary. And while I was there, um, Two wonderful people, Dr. Um, Dr. Judy Wallace and Drake Sharp came to me and said, we've been watching you and we think you're really creative and we would love if you would create something. We're going to call it literacy workstations. We don't want to call it centers. And I was like, sure, what's it going to be? And they said, I remember Drake saying to me, I don't know, you're going to figure it out. <laughs> it's not going to be centers. And um, so that's really how that whole journey began. And it wasn't anything like that. I woke up one day and said, I want to become famous. I want to like have everybody around the world do this thing called literacy stations. It was really a long string of events that, that took me to that place. Yeah. Um, so I always, you know, I always tell teachers, make sure that you know why you're doing what you're doing, um, that you can always articulate what you're doing and why. And I'll tell you, I learned that from Betty. I mean, she, I talked to her this day. She's a wonderful, wonderful um, mentor and friend. And, um, you know, I think it's so important not to do things just because somebody says to do them and to follow blindly, but to actually do things because you believe in them and you understand why you're doing them. So at this point in my career, I'm like way on the other end of it. I'm like kind of like getting to the slow down part. Um, like this morning, I worked in my garden and I'm going to a nursery when we're finished <laughs> and I've got dirt under my fingernails right now. Um, and so I'm kind of at this stage of my life looking back and reflecting, even though I'm still working actively. And um, I would say that probably, you know, some of the biggest lessons that I have learned have been from being open to other people and listening to their wisdom and to their advice. And um, um, another, another one of those people is my, um, she's my undergraduate professor for literacy for language arts. And um, she became a mentor to me early on. And uh, um, when I, when I graduated from college, she told me to go to a different university for my master's degree. She said, go somewhere bigger, go somewhere else, get another perspective. And I, I've always been very glad that I listened to her advice and, and did so. Um, so the, the road to becoming a writer, the road to become a consultant, um, the, re, the road to becoming um, a teacher, a uh, teacher educator, all have little twists and turns and bumps in the road. And um, I think sometimes those discouragements have turned into the biggest blessings in the long run. 
um, I'm glad I had some of those diversions along the way um, and that things didn't work out because I think that that's what made me a stronger, um, you know, better educator along the way. So, so those are just some of the highlights. Um, people always ask me like, what's your favorite grade to teach? And I say, I love the one I'm with. <laughs> um, I started out when I was in college, I ran my own preschool in the summers and um, I, Gosh, in the summers when I was a kid, I used to um, make all the neighborhood kids come into my basement. I had a school set up down there. <laughs> and my boyfriend says, I can just imagine it be like, oh my God, here comes Deb. Run, she's going to make you play school. <laughs> so that's always been a part of a part of me. Um, but I ran, a, I ran a preschool when I was in college. And then um, I also did some work around centers when I was in college. We called them centers back, back then in the 1970s. And one of my professors invited me to go to her graduate class to talk to her students about the ideas I had for centers even back then. So it's interesting to go back and trace your roots to things that happened along the way that you just had no idea it was all going to pan out. And um, another kind of interesting thing I think about being a writer is that many times when I work with teachers, um, we were always trying to get kids to write about different things and, you know, don't keep writing about your dog or don't keep writing about this or that, but I've been writing about literacy stations since 2003. Wow. And that is, that's a long time. It's almost 20 years of writing about the same topic, but what has happened is that the more you write, the more you learn. And so I think sometimes it's good to encourage people to write about a topic they're passionate about and to keep digging deeper into it. Um, I just finished writing this new book on small groups and I know you blessed me by reading part of it as I was working on it and it's amazing to me how I got new ideas just through that process of writing even though I've written about it before because new yeah. things emerge as you're writing so that's awesome I I have so many questions and connections and I think just kind of maybe moving backwards but um just 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 now I feel like I learned something new or have something to think a little bit deeper about uh, we definitely want children to have a wide variety of writing experiences and what you were saying really connected to me again you know like the different genres of writing and and the last major thing I wrote was my dissertation and that obviously is totally different than you know I lean more towards enjoying reading uh, fiction and so you know different writing types and and different genres of writing and then marrying that with topics that you're really interested in um you had mentioned earlier um you know the concept of writing with kids and have kids do more writing um i always um kind of uh pontificate or share that i feel like part of the reason that that seems like a it's not um, a black hole per se, but it's always like a gap. And I think that's because we spend a ton of time around reading, you know, and if you are in a room of adults, random adults that you picked and you ask who's a reader, you're going to get whatever percentage. Um, but you're almost guaranteed if you say who in here is a writer for like one or two people out of 100 to say raise their hand, even though every person in that room writes checks, they write emails, they, they don't think of it that way. And so um, it feels like in our society as a whole, and I don't know if it's true outside of the US, but we don't see that as a pleasure time activity. We don't see it as a pursuit or a hobby necessarily. The vast majority of people don't. And so that just trickles down into the teaching profession. And I think that because it's not something people do for fun, um, like reading or working out or uh, gardening or cooking. Um, therefore, teachers don't always feel comfortable teaching. You have to kind of have a bit of knowledge to teach that. And so do you want to share a little bit about that? Yes. Um, in my work with teachers, um, what I usually do is I go through the reading door instead of the writing door. <laughs> and I go through the reading door for just that reason, because most people identify with being a reader. Um, many of us probably have really uh, strong memories. Those of us that are reading teachers, a lot of us have strong memories of being a child as a reader. Um, one of my fondest memories is of being in the library in my little town that I grew up in. I would go over to that library and I'd sit on the floor curled up books with app for hours. I'd spend like the whole day at the library. The rest of my family did not go. I went by myself. <laughs> um, 
And I also have very strong memories of being a writer. I used to write poetry when I was a little kid, like in elementary school and hide it under my bed. Um, I was kind of a weird child probably, but, um, but most people don't have those memories of being a writer. I think they have the memories of being a reader. So when I, when I work with teachers um, in the field of literacy, I typically go through that reading door because people are more comfortable. Um, I will often go into working with them as writers only once I feel like they have a good handle on teaching reading. Yeah, I think it's a lot to help. I think it's a lot to expect people to do both really well at the same time. Um, with the new standards that came out in Texas a couple of years ago, I love the connections that the standards made between teaching and reading and writing. And I'm really trying to get people to look more at marrying those two pieces together. Um, good writers are good readers um and if you ever read a, a, a good piece of writing like a kid has done you can see the little snippets of things that they've read along the way um even as an adult writer um i remember one of the first books i wrote i had to write acknowledgements in it and i was like i don't know how to write acknowledgements i've never done this so i got a bunch of books and i read the acknowledgements pages before i ever wrote mine so that idea of having models or mentor text, I think even as an adult writer is really important. So, um, so I think, you know, I do the same thing. I, I, I probably could go through writing, but I, I want people to be successful. So I start with reading first. I'm wondering about, um, I think that you, it's really powerful when a person, no matter really who they are, but when a person learns it for themselves before they start mm -hmm. teaching, but yeah. if you think about it, if you're a classroom teacher, you did have to learn how to decode. You do did have to learn and improve your fluency. You did have to learn sight words. You did have to improve your comprehension. However, when you become a teacher, it's not like you have to relearn decoding and relearn, you know, they're internalized. And I think that those of us who try to be stronger and stronger literacy influencers, leaders, whatever you want to label it, um, but for writing, because I feel like there is a bit of a, and I don't know what the term is, gap or absence of that kind of um, life or pursuit. Um, I do think for me anyway, if I'm working with anyone in the educational field, um, I want them to experience the journey, all the things like, you know, you're basically like, as you're describing, you had an interest and a passion, even as a child, but then there had to be many moments throughout your life where you had to persevere, where, mm -hmm. Uh, you were trying to get something published and like you had to seek a, an expert or get mentors or you had to look at tech. You had to persevere. It's not always sunshine and roses and pleasure. No, it's not. No, I can't tell you how many times I was rejected before I had a book published. Um, like I said, I wanted to write about working with African-American kids and nobody wanted to publish it. Right. It's like, no, nice idea, but no, we're not interested. And um, um I, you know, when I did get my first book published, it was, um, again, it was a lot of, you know, the, I started writing in 1983. My first book was published in 2003. So I did a lot of writing other stuff before I wrote a book. Like I said, I wrote tests, I wrote curriculum, um, I wrote workbooks um, because yeah. that's what we used in those days. But all of those little experiences is really what I cut my teeth on as a writer. Um, it didn't just happen overnight. So. So it's, that's why, like earlier I was saying, I feel like I learned something new or have something more to kind of think about because um, you know, I have a son who's about to graduate high school, as you know, and, um, he is actually a very good writer. I've discovered that as time has passed on of all the qualities, I think he actually is an amazing writer due to some excellent teachers, but, um, that I, it's really probably started in middle school, but like it, it would make me laugh and not laugh, but you know, this concept of like, they write something and they're done, mm -hmm. you know, like really good writing involves going back to that piece or using your interest and knowledge in a different piece. And so, like you had said, like, you know, for students to um, revisit work and go in deeper, as opposed to writing about a million different things, you know, they, they, there's a balance. It's not one or the other, but I really think that's such a powerful concept to consider. Um, and that, you know, if we could wave a magic wand that over the life of a child pre-K to 12 and then beyond um, that, it's not only okay or expected, but it's part of the journey to revisit pieces um, and to take from those and put them in different formats. So I just really think that that's something I haven't really thought about. Yeah. It's it's funny when you when you were sharing that. It, I can I really I can vividly picture things that I wrote 
in school. There weren't a lot of them. I think it was in fifth grade. We had to do reports and my parents had just bought a set of encyclopedias. <laughs> Um, and I remember where they were in the living room, you know, they all had like the, you know, the navy blue binding that all matched. And I loved the encyclopedia. It was so exciting. Um, and um, I remember I did one of my reports was called um, Mountains of Meat and Valleys of Vegetables. Wow. <laughs> and it was all about food groups and uh, what was healthy and what wasn't. And I had to illustrate it. And again, it probably looked kind of something like this, but it had like pencil, colored pencil illustrations that went with it. Um, and those were things, even this piece that I wrote here, it's not something that you just wrote and handed in. It was something that you worked with for multiple days and you went back and you revised it and you changed things and you made it better. And, um, and I think that's part of, that's part of being a writer. It's not like you just slop it down. Um, it made me think that you were talking about your, your son, when my son was in high school, one day he came home and he's like, mom, I got this paper due tonight or tomorrow. And I was like, did you just find out about it? Uh, he's like, well, uh, well, kind of. And I said, well, what, what, what's it about? He goes, I don't know. And I don't know what the topic was. I don't remember, but he showed me. And I was like, what the teacher do? Pull this out of a hat? And he said, well, actually we did. <laughs> He said he had like a bag and we all had to reach in and pull out a topic. And this is what I got stuck writing about. And I remember it's really late. And I was like, you know what? It's not worth it. I said, I'm just going to write it for you. Like, let's just do it together. So I, down, I sat down, I practically wrote it for him. I got a B minus. <laughs> I was so ticked off. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but that's, that's the kind of thing that sometimes is done because people don't know what, they don't know how to teach writing. So this whole idea of assigning what to write about, you know, like I look back and I, I think everything I remember writing, I had a choice about. Yes, I had to write an autobiography, but what do you know better than your own life? So, um, you know, they were things that I was interested in. So yeah. whenever I work with teachers, I always say that kids should write about two things. And this is advice that I use myself as well. You should always write about what you know about and what you care about. And that's my best advice for anybody who's a writer um, or is working with kids that are writers to, to think about those two things. So I love that. Um, I want to go back to, you mentioned, you know, focusing on the why and, um, you know, in my, I'm in my fifties and, you know, there are certain things that seem silly to say big girl moments, but there are certain things that you feel so secure and you're like, this is part of being a grown up. You know, you feel like you should have felt this long ago, but you know, there's different stages of life. And uh, I was thinking when you said the why and, and, you know, not just being compliant, but I think that that is for an educator and even leaders of educators where you're talking about principals or superintendent or district people, you know, um, compliance comes first. Like what are the rules of the game and let me do this. And uh, but then I do think it's a marker uh, of you as a professional and um, becoming, you know, developing your expertise um, that you have, you know, whenever your brain or somebody outside of you um, kind of starts pushing on you about why are you doing and not in a, you know, a gotcha way, but really reflecting on, you know, is this at the corner of your beliefs, research and, you know, classroom practices and really being secure in your why, you know, those core beliefs should then drive your practices. You mentioned Dr. Wallace, and uh, I always am reminded, you know, that beliefs drive your practices, practices drive your resources. And that's been something I hold as one of those uh, uh, guiding sticks for me. So, um do you want to talk? I know you work with teachers and educators of all kinds across the U.S. Plus writing about it. Um, do you feel that way as well? That's a bit of a marker in your career. Um, absolutely. Um, it started for me when I was very young. I was um, I was I had already taught. I had I, my first teaching job. My uh, my principal was um, he was ex-military and um, it was rough. <laughs> <laughs> I remember my conferences had to do with things like um, I was the way I dressed uh, was not appropriate because they taught kindergarten and I was wearing uh, corduroy pants instead of dresses. Um, I had a pet rabbit in my room that he said was not being cleaned up 
after frequently enough. Um, I mean, there's nothing about teaching like that I even remember. Um, and then I had the opportunity, I, I moved um, to Pencil, or from Pennsylvania to, to Texas and I, I worked with, with Betty, um, Betty Bennett at the time and, and she would come into your room, like it was an open classroom, I will never forget, it was an open classroom and um, you had to put your objectives on the board and everybody always hated that. It's like, put your objectives on so you know what you're teaching. It never bothered me to do that because it, it just made it clearer. And I remember, my next my next door neighbor teacher beside me she'd be like oh my god oh my god Betty's coming Betty's coming and I'd be like yeah and she goes I know but like you have to be able to tell like what you're doing and I said yeah because if you don't know what you're doing she's going to ask you why so I think that my why was established when I was a very young 20 something teacher because of the administrator I worked with who um, she would just come, she'd have a clipboard and she's kind of serious and she'd kind of sit there and she'd take notes and people were freaking out. And I was like, I don't know if I did something wrong, but I'm just doing what I know how to do. And then she would talk to me afterwards. And, you know, as long as I could tell why I was doing something, there was no problem. And I remember um, I was in graduate school um, during that time and I decided to study um, teaching writing to young children. It was a brand new idea. Uh, I was uh, 1980 was a brand new idea to think about um, teaching very young children how to write. Donald Graves was just on the scene. And so I studied his research and his work. And um, um, he had this young graduate student named Lucy Calkins, <laughs> who was not even on the scene yet. So it's just kind of funny to look back at those times. And, uh, and I remember that Betty and I had this conversation about um, writing and teaching grammar and and color coding sentences and i mean i was young and i i said to her i just don't i don't think this makes sense to do this and she said well if you can find a reason not to let me know and we'll talk so that's what i did my master's project on <laughs> so right from the get-go i you know i really learned how to defend not defend but really state my why and um because of it i I've, I've never stayed in a bad place i i have left <laughs> Um, when things were, when I couldn't make the changes that needed to happen and it was affecting me personally, um, and I, I'm a big prayer warrior and I would pray fervently about it. And it's like, okay, show me when to leave and I'll go. And so I just followed the path, not the path of least resistance, but the path that I felt was opening up for me to take, um, which in the year 2000 led to me starting my own business. It was not my idea. <laughs> it, was, it was a voice that came to me and said, I want you to start this. I want you to leave the security of your classroom. And you're going to, you know, if you're going to go out and you're going to start working with teachers. And um, looking back, I guess it was kind of a scary thing to do, but it, it was what I knew I needed to do at the time. So, well, I think that that, um, thank you for that, because I think that concept of the why runs across so much of our lives and the journey and i know that i've shared with you before deb we have a lot of friends in column co um common and as a brand new teacher i distinctly remember coming to somebody who we both know and i was very excited about my penguin unit and i went on forever about my penguin unit and how crafty and fun it was going to be and she calmly stood there and listened until i stopped talking and then all she said was, what does that have to do with pre-K and the pre-K guidelines or kinder? And she turned and walked away. She really didn't even wait for my answer. And I was so, I went from astonished to angry to, you know, all the emotions. But later I realized, you know, I'm in Texas. There are no penguins. And so it, it, it didn't align in any way. And so there's no that, snow either most of the time. <laughs> no. So, you know, that ties to the why. And then, you know, having been, a coach like you, you know, a principal working at the district office. And like you mentioned, you know, you're all, everyone has a boss. We all have a boss. And so, uh, you know, that why then carries forward as you're moving um, through your life. And then when you're much more aware of your core beliefs and then you, those magical moments where you work with people and you're like, oh, it's just synergistic. And then, you know, by, I feel like I'm lucky. I've only had a couple of times in my life where you're uh, being led by someone and you're like, mm, this, this is not a good alignment here. Or sometimes for various reasons, someone is leading and they don't quite feel, they don't quite know and they're kind of faking it and they don't realize like everybody knows. So uh, I think that that why is so important that the ability, you know, Brene Brown, another good Texan, you know, that ability and willingness to be vulnerable, a tremendous growth can happen, but for sure having those core beliefs in place and knowing your why and all things I think is so important. 
Well, um, if, you look, if you look behind me, Michelle, I don't know if you can see the sign on my wall, um, but it says, why is that? <laughs> And uh, it's, um, like I said, it's my favorite word. I, I love the word why, because if we're not asking it, um, I don't think that, um, you know, I want to always understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. Just yeah. it helps. It helps to make decisions a lot. Yeah. Um, I, I try to jot down a couple of things. I really, um, you know, like you said, you didn't plan, you didn't wake up or as a five-year-old or a nine-year-old say, you know, I'm going to do all these things. Um, it was a journey and um, the trail was, you know, a lot of variety there, but, you know, um, the need for how to support teachers in new concepts, like how to break off from whole group instruction and go into kids having independent practice and for you to pull small groups, you know, the workshop model, um, you know, it was like you, your knowledge, your expertise um, and the need, you know, meeting together and uh, you doing the work and putting forth the effort. And then I think also um, being in classrooms, you know, you mentioned like you really love listening to other teachers. So it's a marriage of all those things. It's like your instructional knowledge and your gut um, and what research says plus like what is needed in classrooms because you've traveled and worked in a lot of different classrooms and there, if, let's say it's 4,000, it was 4,000 different needs and situations. Um, so I think that that is such a great um, cocktail of uh, items that come together. And I think if you do you know one without the other or the, all of those pieces, it won't be quite the same. Um, do you do you want to talk any any about kind of all those things coming together and even maybe um you know you and i um uh have lived through similar time periods and so at you know 80s 90s you know as things are moving and changing what that looks like yeah so i've been through a, i've been through a lot of different movements in education i said they yeah uh, the reading wars are back for the third time <laughs> in my career um and, um, you know, I, I lived through, I started teaching in the 1970s. Um, I started out as a kindergarten teacher. And back then, you, I mean, we made our own curriculum. There weren't any state standards. Um, I was well-trained in early childhood. I had a fantastic undergraduate experience. I went to a state college that was a teacher's college. Um, I had wonderful mentors. Um, just I had a really good program. And I... I was very unusual, I think, in that when I started teaching kindergarten, I actually knew what I was doing as a first year teacher. And I was the only kindergarten teacher in the building. So they kind of left me alone. And I have very vivid memories of things I did that, that first year as a teacher. Um, and I am still friends with one family in particular that their daughter became a teacher. And she remembers stuff that we did in kindergarten all those years ago, which is just crazy. Um, so I think I I grew up I grew up as a I grew up as a teacher in a really special time. Um, the 1970s were filled with lots. It was called the language arts, and there was a lot of art in it. We had um, poetry was very new on the scene of working with young children. Children's literature was just starting to boom. Um, it was um, we did a lot of integration of the arts with with literacy. Um, I was able to learn about how to teach young children to write, which was just booming on the scene. And then came this interesting time called whole language. And um, I was not a classroom teacher really very long during whole language, um, but I was starting to, um, to do some consulting on the side. It was the time that I was having children and I worked part-time doing some publishing and doing some per diem work. So I had a lot of time to read and research. Um, so what I remember most about whole language is kind of crazy. Um, being in Texas, I, I can remember we used to, I'm a little weird. So um, <laughs> we would like dress up to match the theme that we were teaching. <laughs> so if you were teaching about the legend of the blue bonnets, you would wear blue that week and you would like, you would make food with blueberries. <laughs> I, you know, like everything, I don't know, it was just, it was just kind of, you know, it was like rodeo stuff and everything had to do with the rodeo. So whatever you were studying, you just really went whole hog with it. Um, it was a really fun time to be a teacher. Um, 
then in the 90s, we learned about guided reading and balanced literacy came to be. And it was um, just really a cool time because there was such an explosion of understanding how reading worked. I mean, even in the late 80s, a lot of the reading comprehension work, um, Scott Paris's work was coming out. And um, I had never heard about metacognition or teaching kids to think you know, as readers. Um, so a lot of this, you know, kind of learned along the way. And then after the whole guided reading and balanced literacy came to be, um, I went out on my own as a consultant. And then this thing came about called Reading First. Um, and then Reading First had all these rules and regs and you had to do this and you could only teach reading separately from writing. You couldn't teach writing during reading. And I was like, okay, we can still do it, just not at the same time. So you kind of learn to go like under the radar with some of this stuff and just, it's like good teaching is good teaching. Um, recently, we've had um, a lot of things about the science of reading coming to the forefront. I've been doing lots of digging in and understanding how that works. Um, I, I don't know how I learned to read. I have zero idea. <laughs> I really don't even remember learning how to read as a kid. I just know I, I, I could read when I was in elementary school. Um, and I understand phonics. I didn't have to take a phonics course to understand it. So I must've had some phonics along the way. But, um, but what I've been doing is I've always believed that learning how to read is a combination of phonics as well as oral language because if you don't have oral language, you can't understand what you've read. And you have to have some phonics to decode because English is an alphabetic language. Um, so of course you need those pieces. But I don't know that I was as explicit and systematic in the past as I am today. So the biggest things I've changed over my career is I have become much more explicit as an educator. Um, I've looked at becoming a lot more systematic as I've, um, you know, work through the years. Um, and um, but like I said, good teaching is good teaching. It's just little tweaks along the way. So it'll be interesting to see what comes next. I, you know, I think a lot of us uh, really learned a lot about technology during this whole pandemic situation. Um, my biggest heartache during this time was that I could not be in classrooms and classrooms are my lifeblood. That's where I get my great ideas. That's where I kind of come on fire is because I'm with kids and teachers. So it's been hard um, doing a lot of virtual things, but I'm, I'm back, I'm back in the classroom again. <laughs> My wonderful well, friends in Texas have opened up their doors to me. So it's been that's good. Awesome. I think that um, I appreciate everything you just said about going. I think context is so much more important than people realize. And when people set context for me, I can feel my brain almost relaxing and being so, it's so delicious to me and so appreciative. Um, and I think that 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 story told by many people uh, is so valuable to so many people. And I appreciate you sharing that. And I do think it's fascinating to me that in well over 150 years, we can't all agree on how to best teach kids how to read. Uh, and that is a fact. And another mm -hmm. fact is that over 60%, you could pick any district in any part of the US and you could just randomly pick the number 60% and you're gonna be pretty close. Um, that that's the percentage of people who are reading below or far below a uh, level. Um, and so I, I'm the same as you. I have distinct memories of um, the system by which I was taught to read, but not all the little tiny components uh, I learned to read. Uh, but knowing that 60% of our society is not learning to read obviously means like we're not there. And it is, um, it, it, it's a marriage and it sometimes it feels like I know when you or I, if we're working with a group of newer teachers or teachers who need information, um, they'll feel like we're giving contrasting information because it does have to be systematic. It's I, uh, I align it with cooking. You know, mm -hmm. you and I both can have the same recipe for enchiladas. We're in Texas. So let's say enchiladas. Mm -hmm. We can have the same recipe or lasagna. It doesn't matter. Um, and ours are going to taste different. So, you know, it can be, there are components there for a good lasagna, you're going to have to have some noodles, you're going to have to have some meat, you're going to have to have sauce, you're going to have to have cheese. Those are the components, but how it's going to come out. Or vegetables. <laughs> yeah, vegetables from you. I Don't forget vegetarian not. lasagna. <laughs> yeah. So like that, there is that, the science of it, right? But then to me, there's also the art of it because we know in every classroom, the makeup of that class is different, the needs are different. Um, and so I think that to me, in my opinion, that um, the art of teaching reading 
Um, you can't have one without the other. And we can train up and make, systematize many things, but that teacher then has to take it and marry that with the class and the class needs the why and 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 develop their own craft that pedagogy of of what they're doing and why i think it's just so big and and we're in such a fast-paced world uh that sometimes it's not always allowed for or even celebrated or recognized and so it to me it's like two halves of the whole yeah it, it is in fact um you're saying that reminds me of my um my late husband had cancer. And when I went to see his oncologist before he passed away, um, because he was in the hospital, I couldn't go. And his doctor said to me very kindly and very wisely, this is why it's called the art and science of medicine. He said, we have science and science tells us certain things, but then there's also the art of practicing medicine. And he said, it is a combination. And that has always stuck with me as well. Uh, he knew his why. <laughs> Um, but he also wasn't afraid to put in his own, um, his own personality, his own experiences. Um, I just had a conversation with a client the other day and I said, you know, if there was one program or one way to teach reading, we'd all have been doing this long ago. There yeah. isn't just one way that's going to do it. It's a combination of things. And it's funny that you said that, um, you know, we've been having this debate for years. I was at my aunt and uncle's house a couple nights ago and um, you, uh, you taught me about this app called Marco Polo that I, that I use with my grandchildren now because I'm in Pennsylvania and they're in Texas. So we have gotten into this thing where every night um, Colton, who is five, wants me to read a story to him or, or a book to him. So I read to him faithfully every night. And if I forget, he calls me on the phone and says, Nanny, you forgot. I'm waiting for a book. <laughs> Would you read, please? So I was at my aunt and uncle's the other night and I was like, oh, I forgot to pack a book and I'm going to spend the night. I don't have a book with me. So I asked my aunt, I said, you don't have any, any children's books here at your house, do you? And um, my uncle said, actually, I have a whole shelf full of, of antique books that are children's books um, that are in my bedroom if you want to go and get and pick one out. So I was like, I wonder what's in there. So I found Peter Cottontail. So I read him um, a book from the early 1900s um, with the illustrations of Flopsy Mopsy from Peter Cottontail with Flopsy Mopsy and, and um, all of that. But then there was a book that really caught my eye when I was done reading to my grandson. I asked my uncle if I could look at this other book from 1888 and it was a first reader. And in the front of it, there was a note to teachers. <laughs> so of course he wouldn't give me the book, but he said that on his past thing, I was in his will, it said, I got the bottom shelf of books. <laughs> yeah. But this was, I believe it was his grandfather's um, reader that he had. But it was so fascinating because it's all the things we talk about today. It's like there have to be some phonics. Here are some words that you can decode. Um, it was just incredible to see that history repeats itself and just to see that circle of life and how things just they keep coming back and coming back around. So, yeah. So I have two final questions for you. The first is, you know, throughout our conversation, you've mentioned that your initial passion was how to, as a white teacher, support or as a teacher, how to support um, children of color, how to better do that work. And, um, you know, for whatever reason, whether um, it wasn't the season um, or people were not interested, whatever it may be, it, it most certainly feels like we're living in the time where that is a big part of our national conversation. Um, so do you feel like as you re-enter back into the classroom that equity uh, and uh, equity of literacy for all students it will be a big part of the work that you do? It already is. It has been for many, many years. Um, I will tell you my defining moment in that was um, back in 1999 when I read a book to my class called Uncle Jed's Barbershop by Marguerite King Mitchell. And I, I had been talking to a friend um, well, my, my very, very dear friend, Tanji, who lives in Houston, um, who's an African-American woman. And one day we were, she's my jogging partner. One day we were jogging together and I said, I just don't know what to do. You know, like I just can't seem to reach my kids. And I said, I'm trying to treat them like I treat everybody. And she stopped it in her tracks and she put her hand beside mine. She said, Miss Deb, she goes, look at us, we're different. <laughs> we are different. She said, that's a good thing. And she said, 
it's okay to not do everything exactly the same. She said, um, you know, we have to consider that we all come from different cultures and different places. And I said, you know, what's one thing I could do? And we started talking about books. And she said, when I was a kid, she goes, we didn't go to the library. My parents were not allowed in the library when they were growing up. They couldn't even go. And I hadn't, I didn't have that perspective. And so I started becoming very sensitive to making sure that the books that I was reading to my children matched them and, you know, looked like them and they could see themselves in the books. And so this Uncle Jed's Barbershop was really my first discovery of that, which is embarrassing to me to tell you it took me that long to figure it out. But honestly, nobody was talking about it back then. And so, um, so diverse children's literature is one very small thing that we can do and it's been a big part of my work with with students um, to make sure that that kids can see themselves reflected and they can see their cultures reflected in the books that we are choosing to read to them so that's a very small piece that we can do but it's a piece that i have been doing consistently for many years and will continue to do um, I think that the more we can have conversations with people from cultures other than our own, that's the other piece that has been hugely instrumental in the work that I've done. And, um, and making sure that I understand cultural backgrounds and can be sensitive to that. So that's, that's what I have tried to do and what I'll continue to do as I, as I work in schools. So I'm working on a, a couple of reservations right now, which is really a whole new culture for me to learn about. So I've been working in South Dakota and I have um, a new school I'm working with in Arizona next week. Um, two different um, different groups, um, different, um, different groups, different tribes that I'm working with. And so that's been fascinating. And again, just paying attention and listening and asking questions and being open to understanding other people's why. Um, it's really important. That's amazing. I also think tying back on to writing, you know, um, for ch all children, but especially um, children of color um, and, and also different cultural experiences to know that their story is important to be heard and recorded, Absolutely. Um, whether it's oral language or later written language um, and that pride you feel, you know, today, uh, you found your writing and uh, we all feel pride in um, and making sure, like you said, they're represented, but also that they get to record their stories and their experiences. Um, so my last question is, um, I understand, I don't know for myself, but I understand from authors that sometimes they say their books are like children um, and you've written quite a few books. Um, I'm wondering, um, you know, I, I'm not asking what's your favorite, nor am I asking, you know, which, but, you know, when you think of yourself as a, a writer, or you put that kind of hat on for a second, is there a book that really stands forward more than any of the others for whatever reason? Actually, there is one, interestingly. Um, <laughs> there, and it's like, you can't have a favorite child, you know, because that's not really right. And I don't really have a favorite book, but there's, there's, um, a couple of moments around some of those books. Um, I will tell you this, every book that I've written is to me like having a baby. <laughs> um, it's a long process. There's a gestational process. Um, when you see your first page proofs, it's like seeing the sonogram. <laughs> When it comes out, I mean, it's just bizarre. It's, it's very, I usually gain weight when I'm writing because it's so stressful. Um, and then hopefully I lose the weight after the baby's born. So actually, I, I don't look at my books as children, but I do look at, at each experience of writing a book as, as a birth of some sort, a birth of ideas. Um, but there's a, there are a couple things that, that I, I can share with you. The, the, the first kind of like thing that pops into my mind is when I got the letter saying that literacy workstations would be published. I stood at my mailbox and I must have screamed. I was so excited. I just could not even believe that that book was getting published. You know, that I got that letter in the mail. Um, another kind of like writer's moment of books um, was the concept of the book Spaces and Places that I wrote, uh, which is a very different kind of a book. It was mostly photographs and they were all colored photographs. It was the first book of all colored photos that had been published it, with uh, Stenhouse Publishers who I was working with. And I, I don't know that other publishers were even doing that. So it was kind of a proud mama moment, you know, that I that I came up with that, that concept of, of using photos. And then the most recent work I've been doing, the Simply Station series, actually came to me in a dream. Um, I have never in my life like dreamt a book, but this baby, I dreamt 
the title of the book. I dreamt what the format would look like. I, I wrote all my ideas down on a plane. I kind of storyboarded the whole thing out. And I knew that it was something that I needed to do to try to, to reach today's, um, today's audience. So I think um, as a writer, it's not necessarily a book, but it's the evolution of all of those books that I've written and how they've come together as a as a, as a set, as a, you know, as a legacy, basically, that, that I'm leaving that I hope the teachers will continue to use after I'm gone, and, uh, or at least gone from the teaching world. <laughs> so. Yes, we're not going to think about that, but I, I do think that, um, uh, I think you would agree with me, it's not necessarily about you, but like the, like, you're very passionate about the why and supporting children and supporting teachers, and that body of work that you have done, um, is substantial and it's very important and it is um you know it has informed generations of teachers and will continue to do so and um i really do want to appreciate you for being with us today on cup of capacity um i want to uh remind the viewers who may be watching um to subscribe so that every month you um, get a notification when we have a new interview at the first of every month um, and also, if you really enjoyed the conversation today, to feel free to tweet or post uh, on your social media uh, accounts and share this link with others so that they can see all of these interviews. Um, and Deb, thank you again for your time today. My pleasure. So. Hey, thanks for listening to this interview. I hope you found value in the conversation, made a connection with your own life, and had an aha moment or two. 